In physics, classical mechanics is enough to explain most phenomena, but there's some behaviors at the atomic and subatomic level that can't be explained by classical mechanics. And that's where quantum theory comes into play. One important aspect related to quantum theory is particle wave duality, which says that fundamental particles, which include things like electrons, photons, and others, exhibit behavior of both a particle and a wave. In particular with light, it was classically thought only to exhibit behavior of a wave, but it can also be modeled as individual discrete particles called photons. So a photon is a particle of light and it has no mass and is electrically neutral. A photon will travel in a straight line in a vacuum unless it interacts with matter and it does so at a speed c which is the speed of light and that's 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. This is the fastest speed anything can go with phys in physics. Anything with mass can not go at this speed and things without mass such as photons, travel at this speed in a vacuum. Because a photon is also a wave, it does have a wavelength. And that wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency. So from waves, the speed of a wave equals the frequency of a wave times the wavelength of a wave. The energy of a single photon is given by its frequency. The energy of a single photon is given by HF where this variable h is called Planck's constant. And this variable h basically leads to the fact that energy is quantized, which means that it can only occur at certain discrete amounts. The fact that energy only occurs at discrete amounts isn't really noticeable in classical physics because of how small Planck's constant is, which is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. So photons are an example of a packet or quanta of energy. Energy is quantized, which means it only has certain distinct values. The possible values of the energy of a system is given by E equals N, where N is an integer, times H, times the frequency of the system. Now Planck's constant times frequency, that was the energy of one photon, and for Discrete energy, that would be the bundle size, or how much energy is in each quanta. N, which has to be an integer, would be the bundle number, or how many quanta of energy there are. For example, in a system where HF, or one joule, there's possible values of energy of one joule, two joules, three joules, or so on, whereas a value of like 2.5 joules, which is not an integer times the quanta size of one, is not a possible value of energy. In this way, energy is discrete, meaning that there's only certain allowable amounts of energy. This is opposed to energy being continuous, as thought in classical physics. Here's an example that looks at a light emitting photons and it's emitting photons with a fixed wavelength of 580 nanometers at a rate of 30 watts. And it's asking to calculate the number of photons emitted in one second. So 30 watts here, that's a value of power. Power is energy over time. So 30 watts is gonna be 30 joules in one second. So it's asking to find the number of 580 nanometer photons to make up 30 joules. So this is gonna use energy equals number of energy packets times HF. In this case, each energy packet is a photon, and then N, the quantum number, would be the number of photons. Now the question gives wavelength, but this formula here use fre uses frequency. So I'm gonna use the fact that light speed equals light frequency times wavelength to get that the frequency is C over wavelength. Now I'm solving for N, so I'm gonna rearrange the equation in terms of N. So I get that N is E lambda over HC, and now to plug in the values. 
and plugging in the values gets 8.7 times 10 to the 19th photons. In addition to light sometimes behaving as a particle, particles can also behave as waves. In classical mechanics, if electrons are shot at two slits, the electrons will go through one of the two slits, and then if there's a screen beyond the slits, the electrons will be detected at two locations opposite the slits. Whereas when light is shot through two slits, the light diffracts through the slits, and then the interference of the two diffracted waves on the other side causes a double slit diffraction pattern on the screen beyond the slits. Young's double slit experiment showed that when electrons were shot through two slits, they weren't just detected at the two points opposite the slits. Instead, the electrons formed a double slit diffraction pattern, indicating that when they went through the slits, they behaved as a wave. Because particles can behave as waves, they have a wavelength called the de Broglie wavelength. The wavelength of a particle is given as lambda wavelength equals Planck's constant over momentum. Now, usually for a particle, we give the momentum as momentum equals mass times velocity. But often when dealing with questions in physics, kinetic energy is going to be involved in the problem somehow. So the formula for momentum is mv, while kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. If I combine these two equations and move some stuff around, I get that momentum is the square root of 2 times mass times kinetic energy. So often when dealing with de Broglie wavelength, you use wavelength as Planck's constant over square root of 2 times mass times kinetic energy. So particles, which aren't thought of as waves, have a wavelength. On the other hand, waves, which don't have mass, have momentum. By rearranging the de Broglie wavelength formula, I can get a formula for the momentum of a wave. I can't use h over mass times velocity because photons don't have a mass. So instead I can write that the momentum of a photon is Planck's constant over the wavelength. While everything with mass has a de Broglie wavelength, and that wavelength is definitely significant for things like electrons, quantum theory is really only relevant when the de Broglie wavelength is comparable to the size of the object. For example, this is a comparison of the de Broglie wavelength of an electron and a cat. The electron's de Broglie wavelength, while very small, at 1.5 times 10 to the negative 11th, is actually pretty significant compared to the size of an atom, whereas the cat's de Broglie wavelength of 1.7 times 10 to the negative 31st meters is very insignificant compared to the size of the cat. So it's not really reasonable to assume that a cat exhibits wave behavior. The next example says that a voltage of 100 volts is applied to an electron at rest and used to accelerate the electron. And it's asking for the expected de Broglie wavelength of the electron. So the de Broglie wavelength formula says that the wavelength is Planck's constant over the momentum of the electron. Now in this case, I don't have the velocity of the electron, so I can't use momentum equals mv. What I can use is the fact that momentum is the square root of 2 mass times kinetic energy. Now, I don't know the kinetic energy, but I do know the work energy theorem, which says that the work done on the electron is equal to its change in kinetic energy. Now, since its initial kinetic energy is 0, the work is just going to be equal to this final kinetic energy here. And then for the voltage done on a charge, the work is simply the voltage applied to it times the charge, which in this case, E is the charge of an electron, which has a magnitude of the elementary charge. So I get this expression here, and now to just plug in the given values for an electron and 100 volts. And the final answer here is 1.2 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. Now, this number is very small, but compared to the size of an atom, this is actually a huge answer. An atom might have a radius of around this much. So the wavelength of an electron is very significant compared to the size of the atom that it's in.